Nigar, um, first of all, thanks for inviting us to your office. And it's really a pleasure to, to meet you guys in person and to see the, the actual facilities here in California. Um, yeah, first of all, can, can you tell us, tell us and our audience a few words about what is so special about your service and what are you guys doing? What are you guys working on? Of course. Thank you for coming. Glad to host you. Um, basically, at Momentus, what we are providing is just like connecting flights that you have here on the ground, where it's always cheaper to get a connecting flight than a direct flight. We're just taking that same business model to space. So we are basically providing this space shuttle service for taking satellites from where the rockets drop them off to a custom orbit where they actually want to be. Um, and we're very excited to be building those space shuttles that can shuttle all these smaller satellites around to where right. they want to be. So that's what we're working on. So it's like that old fashioned concept of space duck, but in a modern, modern 21st century um, style, right? Yes. And um, to add to it, we use water as our propellant. So we can do it very efficiently and very quickly. And we use um, a technology called water plasma propulsion. So um, it's uh, very safe. So we can launch off of manned platforms like the ISS. And it's very cost effective because the propellant is cheap. And um, we use a lot of commercial off the shelf components, which makes our overall um, space tugs, as you like to call it, cheap mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. affordable. So, you know, just to go along with the mission of what we have here at Momentus, our mission is to make space transportation as efficient as possible in order to enable our vision, which is to make um, people to be able to traverse the universe um, as cost effectively as possible um, so that we can move freely through wherever we want be it another planet, mm -hmm. an asteroid, another solar system, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our overall vision and why we're doing everything that we're doing. And how efficient is water? Because it doesn't seem like um, a typical rocket propellant. Yes. Um, it, it doesn't seem like a typical rocket propellant, and it hasn't been used necessarily in the past. A lot of people have separated it into hydrogen and oxygen mm -hmm. in order to be used on chemical rockets, like what Blue Origin does. Mm -hmm. Um, but nobody has used it in the form of water vapor that we do. Um, we managed to do um, this very effectively because we turn this water vapor that we inject into a resonant chamber into plasma, and then we put that plasma out of a converging, diverging nozzle in order to generate thrust. Mm -hmm. So this concept of taking water, turning it into plasma, and putting it out of the nozzle is what allows us to use a propellant such as water and use it effectively and efficiently and get high enough efficiency so that we can get the thrust and the trip times that we're really looking for. Um, so that's why we're using water and um, why it wasn't used in the past. Um, this, is, this is a very long story. I'm sure you don't want to sit here and have <laughs> right. me give you a lecture on, on propulsion. But, but since you've mentioned the plasma, yeah. we know that there are many like least couple of companies that to propose the or actually to manufacture the the plasma thrusters mm -hmm. for the satellites so how is your solution different from them from other people that use water plasma not water plasma the actual plasma um can you be more specific about what other companies you're talking about uh, phase four Oh, okay. So um, with some companies like Phase 4 or with others um, such as Axion that use mm -hmm. Electrospay, etc., um, the, the main difference is the fact that they're basically designed for micro propulsion systems mm -hmm. and um, they don't use water. Um, they use other propellants, other chemical propellants, and they generate micro levels of thrust, like really small levels mm -hmm. of thrust that are mainly designed for really small satellites, CubeSats in particular, mm -hmm. um, in order to be used for doing um, small maneuvers and station keeping, etc., and deorbiting at the end of the life. Mm -hmm. um, our solution is designed in order to be able to um, transport satellites very quickly from mm -hmm. point A to point B, which is basically our business model is transportation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's how we differ from them, is we are able to generate much more thrust, like you know, three times more, in some cases 10 times more, depending on what other plasma propulsion system you're looking at, in order to allow us to do trip times at a faster speed and do it more efficiently than they could. 
Um, so they might have really high ISVs, mm -hmm. which is an efficiency factor, but they don't have very high thrust, which basically means that they're going to go slow, and then very slow. And your model is completely different because they are hardware manufacturers. Yes. So the customer will need to, to understand how to integrate their thruster into their machine design, how to do all the procurement and, and testing, and et cetera, where you guys are providing the services. Right? Correct. Yeah, I think it, it's very different from, from, from the others. Yes, we do not sell, we don't, you know, we built water plasma propulsion system and that's mm -hmm. our proprietary patented technology, mm -hmm. but we are not in the business of um, selling that. We are not a propulsion supplier in, in, by any means. Um, we are a service provider and we primarily provide transportation services like I was mentioning earlier. So that's another way how we differentiate against the, the other right. water. And the reason why we developed this propulsion technology is because we needed something that was going to be both cheap and fast. Mm -hmm. And the existing propulsion solutions for the small set industry are cheap, but they're not fast. So they don't right. provide the thrust levels we need in order to take people to where they want to go. They don't want to wait a year to get there. You know, most people won't want to wait more than three months in order to get to their right. destination, especially if you're talking about a satellite that has a life of a couple of years or five years. They're not going to yeah. spend a year getting there. Like 30% of lifetime. Exactly. Right. Yeah, very good. And who is your ideal customer? Um, our ideal customer is someone who's looking for a particular custom orbit mm -hmm. or destination. Um, so let's say um, they don't want to go to an SSO with an L10 of 9.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to go to sunscreen Kindness orbit or they don't want to be at the exact ISS orbit or where a particular rocket drops them off, but they want to be a little bit higher or lower, slightly different inclination mm -hmm. or a different sun crossing time. So those would be the customers that would ideally come to us and say, you know, we um, are looking to get to this particular destination, but we can't get there. Mm -hmm. um, that's within LEO. And then within GEO, mm -hmm. we have a whole subset of customers who are ideal because um, there are not a lot of options for small satellites and CubeSats to oh, get yeah. there. So they all become our ideal customers because we open up a whole venue of opportunities and, you know, of options to get them from LEO to GEO or GTO to GEO or from a highly elliptical orbit. Um, we open up options for them to use dedicated launch vehicles like, you know, ABL or mm -hmm. Relativity or others to take them all the way to GEO mm -hmm. and beyond. Um, whereas, you know, we perfectly complement the dedicated launch vehicles. Mm -hmm. We also complement the rideshare vehicles, the really big rockets, because, you know, just like you saw the SSO mission, you know, they dropped off like 60 people at the same yeah, place. The same place. Exactly. All those satellites didn't want to be at that one location. Um, so I. Ideally, we would be offering our service on those kind of missions, transporting them to the particular right. desired destination. So we have a whole variety of customers that we consider to be ideal. Um, and uh, some are within LEO. Some want to go to very unique orbits like a Molniya orbit or a Tundra orbit or something mm -hmm. that's very hard to get a ride to, especially if you're a small satellite. Right. Um, and then we have another class, which are large vehicles. Mm -hmm. So if you think of like big geocommunication satellites or um, uh, big, you know, spy satellites and others. A big portion of the spacecraft is actually their propulsion system that's used for that's orbit true. raising. It's their orbit raising propulsion systems. Like with some geo spacecraft, you can consider like a third of their volume. The whole structure of the satellite is built around the orbit raising propulsion system, the two prop tanks and the main station thrusters. So we become a, a great complement to those because now instead of having to fly that on their own satellite, they can fly more payloads. So it, basically enables them to have more mass and so it means uh, that, volume for their payloads. Yeah, right. So it means that the typical geostation satellite today has to have enough thrust capacity to raise the orbit from GTO to GO, mm -hmm. right? And you might be able to change that by giving them basically an orbit of an orbit race from exactly. Leo to GO all the way from Leo to mm -hmm. GO. Wow, that's that's impressive. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah, and then they can carry, so if they, let's say it was a 3,000 kilogram payload mm -hmm. and 1,000 kilograms of it was their prop budget, which was just their propellant, oxidizer, and you know thruster. Now imagine they can carry that much more payload instead of having to carry all that prop right. system because it enables them to utilize even more of the allocated volume within the payload fairing of the rocket for usable payload and not a system that they use just for getting there. Because if you think about it, a geocommunication satellite has like a life of like, so let's say 15 years. Yeah. And they only need this prop system 
during the first couple of months of getting there. Mm -hmm. And once they're there, they're kind of carrying it's around this weight, weight yeah. for no reason. They don't need it anymore for the rest of the 15 years, but That's it's right. essential to get there. So they have no other option but to fly it on the board. The space and it contributes to a lot of their like budget. So yeah, so the their market. station keeping budget has to allocate for all that extra mass and volume that they have to, you know, carry right. around and spend expend extra fuel to keep them in the particular lo right. location that they want to be, um, which with our solution they wouldn't need, for example. Right. So basically, for um, to summarize, for CubeSats and existing Leo market, you guys can um, do the orbital race within yeah. Leo to basically extend the the mission, the lifetime of the mission for typical Earth observation satellite or IoT satellite. Yes. And if they are to survive um, in the 500 or to, to 600 um, kilometers a couple of years, then you guys can extend that their commercial available time for a couple of years more, right? Or you can fix their uh, inclination of their orbits to reach more, to, to make the better sun-sync orbit. Is it correct? Um, so. Sun-sync orbits have a particular crossing time, mm -hmm. so they look at Earth at a particular time of the day. And usually, you know, with these smaller satellites, they go on rideshare missions that all want to look at it at a particular time in the morning, let's say 10 a.m. or yeah. something. So if you have a bunch of satellites already there and you're trying to build up a constellation to right. look at the Earth globally, you don't want to always look at the same time. So yeah. we can help those constellation customers by changing that sun crossing time. So now instead of 10 a.m., it's like 2 p.m. or it's mm -hmm. it's a different time so that they get, you know, more data, more images, uh, you know, across the whole entire day, across the entire spectrum. Um, and that becomes even, you know, more relevant for some people who, you know, have other kind of missions like mm -hmm. a SAR mission or, you know, other types of missions that require, you know, and different How does your tests. timeline look like? So you, because you've mentioned both um, solutions for the LEO economy and mm -hmm. then for the GEO satellites as well. So yeah. how does it land on your timeline of the services that you have to start to provide? So in terms of our roadmap, today we provide Vigoride as mm -hmm. a service, both as a orbit transfer service and Vigoride line, which includes the launch and the um, transfer service. And that's designed uh, between, you know, starting now through 2020, next mm -hmm. year, we're going to be offering that service with multiple launches a year. Some of them, including the, the launch and our orbit transfer service, and some of them are just the orbit transfer service, mm -hmm. depending on our customers. Um, and that's meant to address all the small satellites that want to go within LEO, either launch off of the ISS or off of a dedicated rocket or a big rideshare mm -hmm. mission going to SSO. Then in 2021, we're bringing on our Vigoride Extended, which is designed for taking satellites all the way to GEO. It has a higher delta V, mm -hmm. up to five kilometers per second, so it, it can enable missions that can go from GTO to GEO, LEO to GEO, or all the way to the moon. Like, it can go wow. very far. Um, yeah. And it basically enables a whole new class of missions for people with smaller payloads. That one can carry payloads up to like 300 kilograms. So it's designed for small satellites wanting to go to GEO or beyond. And then in um, 2022 timeframe, we have something called Arteride, mm -hmm. which is our next mission, uh, our next service. And that one will be able to launch things that are up to like four tons. So you're talking big geostationary satellites, big deep space exploration missions will be enabled by mm -hmm. Um, this service and you can launch whole constellations of satellites so let's say you're trying to launch a constellation of small satellites you know all to offer global coverage mm -hmm. you could do that with just you know this one vehicle you can launch like four to five satellites and then you can stack them all on top of each other it kind of looks like an esper ring and then you yep. can mount satellites on the different ports um, and that service is basically designed to address the really big Geocommunication satellites, as well as the big, you know, exploration missions like the Deep Space Gateway and other missions that are, you know, trying to go take samples of different planets, etc. Right. Um, as well as smaller geocom satellites are, that are becoming more and more common now as the geo market is I think evolving. With that's kind of solution. You can also change the inclination to pretty significant, like yes, that one we can do like 
you know, 20 degrees inclination yeah. change up to 40 degrees and even beyond. Like we're doing studies right now of, you know, taking satellites from SSO all the way to GEO. Wow. And we're finding that that's even possible if we want to. Wow. Um, we that would be really important for the, for the future Constellation companies. Yeah. yeah. And, and this service is actually very enabling for Constellation customers, especially for replacement satellites. So they might book one launch vehicle and launch all their satellites like in a 50 at a time or 60 at a time. But then, you know, what happens when a couple of them die and they want to send up replacement satellites? The cost of launching those replacement satellites is going to be quite significant. Yeah. And they're going to have to have multiple launches and then right. they might not get it exactly where they want, et cetera. So um, we're finding with a lot of the customers that we're talking to right now, they're really interested in replacement satellites and also um, potentially deorbiting their satellites at the mm -hmm. end of life. Mm -hmm. Which is a service we'll probably start looking into like later on right. in a couple of years. And it seems like um, it it might be an expensive service because you you have to manage your first leg, which is a dedicated mission or ride share mission, and then s stack on top of it your service. So yeah. how how much of an investment has the company to in order to avail your service? It's actually not that significant mm -hmm. in, in terms of an investment because um, the same way launch vehicle providers can offer ride share missions, we can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we might be um, a secondary on a, on a launch, mm -hmm. but then we can offer people secondary slots okay. within our launches, which then makes them very affordable. It's like ride share within the ride share. Yes. Okay. And also, um, because we take up a bigger chunk of mm -hmm. the mass within the launch vehicle, we get like bulk pricing. So you can think of it as if a CubeSat wants to launch by itself, right. you know, the, the cost per U might be sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right, per per CubeSat. Whereas if they launch, you know, if we book three you know, four hundred kilograms worth of launch capacity in a rocket, we get a much cheaper and price you per get launch. The we primary get primary right share conditions on launch contract with the gate yeah. launch, which is also and, right, so we can book a whole rocket labs, yeah. or we can book a whole, you know, uh, relativity turn rocket, one, yeah. and, or launcher one, etc., and be the primary, and then you know, and that makes it much more cost effective than just you know small satellites launching Amazing. by themselves. So yeah. that's how we can make it affordable. Plus, our platforms aren't really that expensive, as I said earlier, because we use water and you know a lot of commercial components, um, and we're basically taking advantage of a lot of the um, small sat components that have already been disruptive. Mm -hmm. Like you can look at a lot of the avionics and electronics and everything. That industry, uh, thanks to the small sat industry being around and you know being so active, has been disrupted so much that now all those components are quite affordable. So, I mean, maybe not as affordable as the parts in your cell phone, but right. we're going to get there very yeah. soon. Right. And once we get, get to that point, you know, then our service would be extremely affordable. You know, the first couple of ones might not be there because we're still, satellites are still not the same cost as a car. But eventually, as, you know, this industry gets more and more disruptive, every, all the costs will come down, including launch costs, because we're predicting launch costs to come down significantly too mm -hmm. as rockets get larger and larger, you know. And the demand for our services yeah. will increase too because as the, the rocket gets larger and larger, there's no one satellite that can take up all that capacity, right. for example. And these rockets will still go to one location, and people right. will need to get to their final destination from there. Right. Right. Exactly. Very good. Thank you so much, Nigar. You're welcome. Great conversation. Thanks. Thank you.